my screen. Well, hello and welcome to IEBC's webinar on the Caring Campus Toolkit. I'm very excited you're all here. We expect more folks to join us. Oh, Kristen, I love the cat. That's very good. <laughs> um, with IBC, we always like to have fun. So I hope this is an enjoyable webinar for all of you. And um, my name is Brad Phillips. I direct the Institute for Evidence-Based Change. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Kelly Becker of Oakton College. And I'll get to her bio in a little bit. But I want to make sure we start on time and end on time. And with that, um, can you all see my screen? Just a little thumbs up to let me know. And then what I always love, if you're willing, is if you would turn on your cameras. I always love to react to faces. And so it does make things a lot easier when folks do that. But feel free not to if you don't want to. So um, the first thing I want to do is I want to thank the Ascendium Education Group, as well as the ECMC Foundation, the Chancellor's Office for the California Community Colleges, and the Greater Texas Foundation for their generous support of our caring campus work. I'd also like to thank the Community College Research Center, CCRC, of Columbia University for developing in consultation with us this toolkit that you're going to see today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, do me a favor, will you mind using your reaction button? Could you just give me a little thumbs up, those of you that are researchers? And I see some old friends. Ed, it's great to see you. I wonder if you're still driving that convertible bug that you love to drive. <laughs> Not anymore, sorry. <laughs> Not anymore, okay, okay. Well, I know you love that car. So, all right, super. Okay, so about half or so are researchers. Um, and I assume we have some liaisons. Uh, please put thumbs up if you're a liaison for Caring Campus. All right, Debbie, thank you. And please put your thumbs up if you are an administrator at your college. Okay, Diana, all right, good. And any faculty here, please put your thumbs up. Okay, Nathan, thank you, good. Rebecca, Ricardo, great. All right, well, let's get started now. In order to kind of ground everyone into what this Caring Campus stuff is about, I'm gonna go over a little bit of Caring Campus and, and what this whole process entails before we ask Dr. Becker to talk about the research that she's done at Oakton College. And then from there, we'll jump into the toolkit and how that all works. So with that, a little bit about the Institute for Evidence-Based Change. So we've been around for a little over 10 years. I come from the California Community Colleges, started at Yuba College and went to Grossmont Cuyamaca. I directed research planning and academic services. And way back in 1998, I started something called the CalPASS program, which was the California Partnership for Achieving Student Success, which for us research types was a voluntary data system that brought schools, colleges, and universities together to track students from segment to segment. So from K-12 to community colleges, to universities. And then what we did with that data is we brought faculty together to look at student transition from segment to segment. Specifically, the faculty were there to look at that data and talk about the exit skills in one segment and how they aligned or didn't, and they most often didn't, with the entrance expectations in the next segment. And so that program ran for a few years. Now it's known as CalPASS Plus, and it's primarily a data system in California. IEBC focuses on two core initiatives. The first that we'll be talking about today is Caring Campus, and um, we'll, again, walk through that. But we also focus on helping colleges use their data better. Um, would you mind putting your thumbs up if you've heard of our book, Creating a Data-Informed Culture in Community Colleges? Okay, a few people. All right, good, good. Well, it's still around. It was done in 2017 with my co-author, Jordan Horowitz, and it seems to continue to resonate in graduate school. So we're happy about that. Um, we are currently working in 31 states. Um, we just got another grant to work with rural colleges on Caring Campus, so we're likely to be continuing this work in a number of other states. Oh, before I go on, I do want to introduce a few IABC staff members. First and foremost is Natalie Bropes, 
who directs just about everything at Caring Campus and keeps us doing everything we need to be doing. And we recently hired, I'm very grateful to say this, Bala King Rushing, who was our Associate Director of Caring Campus, and uh, my long-term friend and colleague, Dana Quitner, who's our Public Information Officer. So thank you all IABCers for joining us. All right, let's talk about Caring Campus. So the way Caring Campus works is it's very much focused on what we would term leading and lagging indicators. So what do I mean by that? Leading indicators are things that you have high influence over and they influence lagging indicators. So if we look at this pyramid, we know that we have pretty good influence on some of these lower bars. We can beat the bushes and try to bring up enrollment and do all those kinds of things to try to get more students to work with us. I know in the California community colleges, there's a huge focus on dual enrollment. And that focus actually is permeating across the US. So we can do a lot of work to try to make that happen. So if students come, what happens? They end up in classes. And when we talk about course retention, what do we mean by that? Well, many of us have W grades, right, withdrawals. And generally in most states, those W grades are given within the first three quarters of a course. So if it's a 16 week course, those W grades are given from the second week census to the 12th week. So we can work really hard to help students stay in class. And just a fun little fact, and we're working on this grant now with Ascendium, do you know that 20 to 30% of your students who start with you leave pre-census? I mean, this is just extraordinary to me. And these students tend to be the very students that we care most about, students of color and poor students. They leave at higher rates than others. Now, if we can keep them in class and get them through without getting a W, they are more likely to be successful, obviously. And what we mean by course success is earn an A, B, or C. So that's how we term success nationally. So Caring Campus lives really in this retention and this course success area, but we also know that national data tells us that if students receive an A, B, C, or credit, they stay, they persist to the next semester. So term to term persistence, if they get an ABC or credit is about 80%. If they fail their classes, if they W out, they don't come back. So it's really important that we focus on helping students be successful. And that's where Caring Campus lives. Now, if they persist, they're earning credits and units, they're getting milestones such as interim certificates and so forth. And hopefully they get to some completion, whether it's a degree or transfer. And then while we don't have a lot of control over this or influence, we all want our students to earn a living wage, get that good job, and hopefully that's in the disciplines that they studied at our community college or as they transfer to four-year schools. So we think about this leading and lagging pyramid as what do we as educators have influence over? Now, I'd love to say I invented Caring Campus. I invented CalPass, but I did not invent Caring Campus. Caring Campus really comes from early work done by Vince Tinto. And I know we've all heard of Vince Tinto. He started writing about why students leave way back in 1987. And in 1993, he wrote this book, Leaving College. And what he did was he interviewed, and it was primarily university students, but he interviewed them and he said, well, why did you leave? And what he found out was that students don't feel connected. So even though across the US, we've been doing all this work, I mean, billions of dollars invested in all these different initiatives. If you look at iPads data, there hasn't been tremendous increases in completion. So look, we gotta do something different. And Tinto really had this idea, gosh, what? Almost 50 years ago, 45 years ago? More recently in 2020, this book came out, Relationship Rich Education. How many of you have heard of this book? Nobody, I, I highly recommend you read this book. In fact, I keep it on my desk. <laughs> it's so important. And what this book talks about is how these human connections really help students be successful. And I'd like you to think about your own educational experience. Was there a faculty member or a staff member that really influenced your becoming an educator, whether it's a researcher, a faculty member, or an administrator? My guess is you can all think of at least one person in your educational experience where that happened. And I love this quote. 
Decades of research demonstrate that peer-to-peer student faculty and student staff relationships are the foundation of learning. Belonging and achieving in college, these effects are particularly strong for students of color and first generation students. So this book really highlights techniques that colleges and universities have used. And in fact, Kelly Becker's college, Oakton, is the very first story of this connection work in this book. So I'm really excited that they did it. And so it's just fascinating how things kind of come together. Now, what is Caring Campus? You know, our wonderful little cell phones and technology has really caused us to be relatively antiseptic with how we get students enrolled and into courses in community colleges. But you know, this tends to be a very transactional kind of behavior, right? There's no human involved. They're using the internet to connect, that kind of thing. But what we really need to do, and this is what Caring Campus does, is it works to make that transition from a transactional environment to a relational environment. And think about this. When a student first calls your college, yes, they may get an automated thing, but eventually they get to a human being. If that human being is not engaging and, hi, how are you, what happens? Just check your Yelp ratings. If you don't believe me, check your Yelp ratings. Take a look at your data. So when that student walks on that campus, that staff member, or in California, we call them classified professionals, but that staff member really matters, how that interaction works, whether or not they're wearing a name badge so they can identify themselves really matters. When students enter in the classroom, you know, in my day, because I'm old, it used to be look to the left of you, look to the right of you, one of you won't be here at the end of this class, right? How does that faculty member connect with and support each and every student? So we really are positing that we need to move from this antiseptic transactional basis to a relationship basis. I'll give you a quick example. There is a chancellor in the Arkansas system that really wanted to do Caring Campus. And I was talking to him and he was a uh, one of seven children whose parents never graduated high school. There was an oops pregnancy in 11th grade, right? Young pregnancy. And he was the first in his family to go to college. And by the way, his parents never even graduated high school. So we went over to, in this case, Antelope Valley College in California. And of course, a lot of our students have imposter syndrome. He walked in to, instead of the admissions and records building, he walked into administration because he didn't know any better. And the person behind the counter could have said, oh, you're in the wrong building. You need to exit this building on this side, turn north, go three uh, buildings over, take a right at the fountain, and that's admissions and records, right? We've all been there. By the way, my wife says I can get lost in an elevator. Right. So he goes and he, he walks into that building and the person behind the counter says, oh, well, let me show you where it is. So she gets out from behind the counter in from the administration building and walks him over to admissions and records. He says that he never would have stayed in school because it would have confirmed that he was stupid and didn't know where to go. By the way, we have hundreds of stories like this hundreds of stories from the colleges that we work with. So the idea here is while we're all into education, we're all supporting student learning, there has to be that communication, there has to be that connection among our staff and our faculty. Now, there are two flavors of Caring Campus. One is staff, where we work with staff across the country in this work, and we work with faculty as our second flavor. Um, we have, uh, gosh, 121 colleges doing this work right now. And in fact, a bunch more starting. Um, this work focuses on specific behaviors, not attitudes and opinions. Those of you that are researchers, you may have looked at this data. We have about 50 years of it. Um, attitudes and opinions do not necessarily call, cause changes in behaviors. Behaviors come first. This, if, this work is all based on research. Um, and the behaviors don't really cost anything other than name tags. It doesn't cost anything to be human. It doesn't cost anything to be nice to students. It doesn't cost anything to engage in these particular kinds of connections. So this really does, we've seen culturally, and we've been studied by the Community College Research Center, empower faculty and staff because they then start focusing on why they're there, the student focus. And they really work together as part of the student success agenda takes about one year to implement, 
um, almost all of our work is funded by foundations. So colleges across the country don't pay anything to be part of this. Um, and we're really grateful for that. There are a few colleges that do self-pay, but that's very small. Um, the outcomes are dramatic. And in fact, Kelly's gonna share with you because Kelly's college is an early adopter of Caring Campus and they've done some really great work. And by the way, there's little to no ongoing costs. In other words, they don't pay us you know, thousands of dollars to be part of this. Um, behavior change doesn't cost anything. It also works in both the face-to-face -face and virtual environment. Uh, as we were all impacted by COVID, we had to shift like all of you. We had to shift on a dime. So anyone that thinks that community colleges can't move quickly is wrong because COVID proved us otherwise. We all moved in two to three weeks to a completely different environment and our behavioral commitments work for both. And um, we've been studied by CCRC. There's a number of reports from CCRC on our staff work, our faculty work and on leadership work. And I'll put that link in the chat later. So you'll have that link as well as to the toolkit. And by the way, we are being recorded. So for those of you that want to hear this or share this, you're more than welcome to do so. Okay. Um, so CCRC, uh, in partnership with us as part of our Ascendium grant, built this toolkit with us. And it's really designed to support all of you as researchers as this work of Caring Campus starts its implementation, moves through that implementation and goes to full launch. So I'm gonna walk you through after Kelly's presentation, how this all works. And again, the toolkit's free, there's no charge. Um, it has all the qualitative tools in there, you'll see all that. But really the toolkit's just a guide. It's a starting point. All of you are experts, you know, you're well-trained, uh, you can use the toolkit, you can do your own stuff. We'd love for you to share what you're doing with us to see how it's going. Um, you don't have to use all of the toolkit. You can just use part of it if you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's really just that starting point. However, if you are researching Caring Campus, please, please, please connect with us. We'd love to hear how it's going. We'd love to see your results. We could highlight your college about the work that you're doing. So we, we always do that. We always highlight colleges. So with that, you're probably done listening to me. So I'd like to introduce our key speaker, Dr. Kelly Becker, and she's currently the Assistant Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness and Strategic Planning at Oakton College. Oakton's in Illinois, just outside of Chicago, and she's been there for the last four years. Oh my gosh, Kelly, four years. It seems like yesterday that we met. She leads Institutional Research Office um, the Institutional Research Board, Accreditation, Strategic Planning, as well as being the co-principal investigator at Oakton's Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander Serving Institution grant through the Department of Education. And then prior to working at Oakton, she worked at Northwestern University in Student Affairs Assessment, where she earned her doctorate in sociology. And with that, Kelly, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Brad, and thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit about the data that we collect at Oakton and what we've learned. Uh, this work, I want to acknowledge, is developed out of a partnership between uh, our, the Office of Research and Planning, I know that some of my colleagues are here, as well as the Faculty Persistence Project Committee, particularly their data subcommittee. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. Thanks, Brad. So just to give a little bit of context, uh, the Faculty Persistence Project at Oakton, which is what we call our Caring Campus Initiative for Faculty, started in 2016. So as Brad mentioned, we were an early adopter of this work. Although it has changed over time, our faculty commit to these four behavioral commitments. Uh, faculty participation is voluntary. Um, so, and you can see that it's fluctuated quite a bit with lower levels of participation, particularly in the 2020 to 2021 school year um, because of COVID, obviously. Um, but we do see levels of faculty participation bouncing back. And you can go on to the next slide. To give you just an overview of the data that we've collected over the last seven years, um, certainly faculty sign up is an important one, although it seems a little bit mundane. This has been a key task for us to determine who is participating and in which course sections they're participating, because we our um, committee suggests that faculty participate in the persistence project um, for only one course section per semester because of the time commitment, particularly for the one-on-one -on -one sessions. 
Uh, prior to 2018, which is when you'll notice much of our data reporting begins, our signup process was, was much more haphazard, um, which made it hard to confirm and track which course sections and faculty were participating in the project and which students were therefore impacted, um, particularly for our courses who, that were sometimes canceled for low enrollment or when faculty were switching course sections. Uh, since then, we've developed an online system for signing up and can now confirm course sections with faculty through our faculty survey, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. Um, so once we have a clean list of participants, we're able to upload that data into our data warehouse and merge it with our student record um, data from our student information system. We also have conducted, um, again, over the years, faculty surveys and student surveys um, during most terms, although not all. And I'll get into more details on what the, how we've conducted those surveys and what they've contained. Um, as I mentioned before, we have student record data um, linked to our persistence project participation information. So we can see who's been impacted, um, what kinds of course sections have been involved, grades and withdrawals for students, and persistence have been two of the things that we've looked at most closely, um, although as well as completion um, and transfer, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. We've also conducted um, some qualitative, collected some qualitative data, including student focus groups and interviews and faculty focus groups. I'll, I'll touch just briefly on those um, kind of towards the end. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. So in terms of uh, the surveys we conduct, I wanted to dig in a little bit more um, and give some more details on these. So for faculty, there's actually two surveys that we typically conduct each semester. The first one happens in mid-September or about mid-February, so the you know within the first about month of the semester. It again asks faculty to confirm the core section that they're um, doing the persistence project in, right, the Caring Campus initiative in. And it also asks about adherence to the commitment. So as you might have noticed before, when I listed our commitments, um, many of them are supposed to happen within the first um, three weeks of course, right? And so for a traditional 16 week class, we wanted to start asking those questions soon after um, that time period had asked. Uh, when I first got here to Oakton, we were doing an end of the term survey and asking people to recall back to September or to January when they were supposed to be doing these and, and to ask about how the commitments um, went or what happened with them. Um, so we were asking people to, to think back, you know, I don't know about you all, but sometimes I forget what happened yesterday, right? So we wanted to, to conduct the survey much closer to when these commitments were, were occurring and when folks would have um, much better recollection. Um, the second survey happens at the end of the term and asks broader questions around their experience, um, their perceptions of the program and how they think it went, as well as support that they, could, um, that they need um, or what they, what they utilized. Um, all participating faculty are invited to complete the survey for each course section, and the response rate is high. So over the last five semesters that we've conducted these surveys, we've had about a 90% um, completion rate for faculty. Uh, one semester, I did want to note, we did do a survey of our faculty who had participated in the project but weren't currently in, involved. Um, I think that was particularly around the time where we saw a dip, was partially due to COVID, but for other reasons as well. Um, and this helped really helped inform our faculty recruitment and the supports that were offered because some things came out of that that indicated uh, ways that faculty could be better supported than that. For our student surveys, um, all students in persistence project course sections have been invited to participate um, in most terms, although not all. Um, we've taken a break at, at various points to kind of determine the data that we have, you know, dig in a little bit more to the data that we have, um, and then also uh, reformat the survey over different terms. Uh, like with most student surveys, I'd be curious to hear from all the research folks, right? Uh, we do have very, really varying response rates uh, for our student surveys, and sometimes getting students to respond to surveys has been a challenge. Um, so we've definitely played around quite a bit with um, timing of the survey. So it used to be like right at the very end of this, the semester. Now we've moved it to a, a few weeks before. Um, we've kind of played around again with um, days of the weeks and some of those kinds of things. Incentives have certainly been important, an important piece to that. And then also getting faculty support. So um, we've had faculty really start to buy into promoting their survey in their course sections, sometimes giving students time to complete the survey in class um, or providing information about the survey in their D2L shells. So really sharing it out and that's helped a great deal. We've also surveyed a comparison student group um, in some terms, um, and, and this is what I'll be reporting on. So they're pulled from matched courses. So for example, if we have three sections of psychology 120 in the persistence project, we'd randomly select 
three sections of Psychology 120 not in the project to also participate in the same survey. Um, so it's a form of kind of cluster sampling that we're doing. We also provide incentives to those students to participate. We certainly have a harder time getting them um, than we do the Persistence Project students, but I've had a fair amount of success in, in getting responses. The topics for our student surveys have, again, have varied over time, but broadly ask about the faculty commitments and if they, um, their perceptions on whether or not those are happening, um, their perceptions of the course and their relationship with the faculty member, uh, their sense of belonging and broadly their Oakton experience. Um, and then something that we're thinking about for the future is um, this is a homegrown survey um, and thinking about are there what opportunities we have to use other student satisfaction surveys or student engagement surveys like the SENSE or SESI and breaking it out based on the kinds of per, um, persistence project or not experiences that students are having. Go ahead to the next slide, Brad. So what have we learned? Um, some highlights from the faculty survey include that they report high levels of completing the commitments, uh, particularly learning all student names and providing feedback to students. Um, those who were not able to hold their one-on-one -on -one meetings within the first three weeks uh, were asked uh, follow-up questions around why not or what held them back. And they were able to report information around struggling to schedule or find time, as well as lack of student response to invitations to meet. So I know the committee has done some extra work on um, scheduling you know, ways to use your um, Google Calendar and Calendly and some other um, tools right, to improve scheduling. And then the second survey, as I mentioned before, offers opportunities for um, the faculty to talk about their experience of the Persistence Project. And as you can see here on the right, much of their comments are very positive around how it enhances students' sense of belonging, improves engagement through connections, uh, and makes them feel that their jobs are more meaningful. And many of them talked about also just what they had learned from getting to know their students um, better or differently and how that um, changed their teaching. Go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, for our persistence project, students similarly reported that faculty are completing the commitment. So it was interesting, you know, sometimes it's interesting to see where um, there are places where students and faculty disagree. Um, across the board, our students agree that, that they're experiencing these things um, in their persistence project classes. So as you can see here, 94% um, of students said that their faculty member knew their name, 90% had had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with their professor. Again, this is at the end of the term. So for faculty who aren't able to complete in those first three weeks, often that's happening even later in the term. Um, and 87% the, said they had received written or oral feedback. And these far exceed when we look at the comparison group, right? This, the number percent of students who report the same things um, from that comparison group. In terms of the relationships, um, Persistence Project students are more likely to report stronger relationships with their faculty members across a range of items, like that the professor knows them and values them, again, compared to their non-Persistence Project peers. And finally, our Persistence Project students are more likely to report on the survey that they're planning to re-enroll uh, rather than transfer or leave the college if they're not graduating the next term. So that's, again, self-reported, um, but we see greater intention to come back. And then you can go to the next slide, Brad. And this bears out also in our persistence data. So when we look at new students each fall and the percent who are enrolled at the college the following fall, or have completed a credential in that time, we consistently see that students who experience the Persistence Project in their first semester at Oakton return at higher rates compared to all new students in the same cohort. I think it's particularly notable the gap in 2020 to 2021 school year, which is during COVID. So we had a slightly smaller number of Persistence Project students during that cohort. If you might remember, fewer faculty participating in that year. Um, but it's also where the gap between experiencing the Persistence Project and um, and not has has the biggest um, where the gap is the largest in that year. So connection, particularly when you think about what fall 2020 was like, was was particularly important. And then on the next slide, Brad, thank you. Um, so this slide shows just fall 2021 to fall 2022 persistence, disaggregated by race and ethnicity. Um, this is you know equity. Particularly racial equity is a strategic commitment at our college. And you can see that this, you know, the higher rates of persistence holds across all the racial ethnic groups that we've disaggregated here. And so students who experience the persistence project persist at higher rates. Um, and it seems to be particularly impactful for our black students where you see a 21 percentage point 
gap between all new students and those who experience the persistence project. And we had a fair number, although black students make up uh, about 9% of our enrollment, um, it was actually slightly higher um, in the persistence project uh, this last in fall 2021. So, um, and this is a trend that we've seen over time, particularly for our Black and for our Latinx students, um, which speaks to the equity impact for our marginalized and underserved students. Um, finally, I want to just touch on completion and transfer. Uh, these data are a bit old. So uh, the last time we really looked at this was with our 2017 first time in college cohort and we gave them 150% time to complete and or transfer. Um, and we've been tracking this using our data warehouse. Again, I haven't looked at the data more recently, um, but you can see that here for students in our fall 2017 cohort who experienced the persistence project but hope to graduate at higher rates, they transfer and they transfer at higher rates in that three year time frame. So definitely in need of some updated data, but I wanted to share with you some things that we learned, we learned earlier on. And next slide. And so finally, I did want to touch quickly on the student focus groups and interviews, which were conducted in fall 2018 by a faculty member. We had about 20 responses. Uh, the intention was to do focus groups. Uh, they offered incentives and food, lots of pizza. I had a hard time getting students to come together. So this was also pre-COVID when we were asking students to come in person to sit in a you know conference room together and talk, and that didn't really work out. So it ended up being mostly um, interviews that happened. Um, and it was a set of homegrown questions uh, based on the faculty research interests and the committee. Um, and so I think broadly what they found, um, what the faculty member found, was um, that all, many themes kind of emerged, mostly po very positive about students' um, experience in the class, although they often don't know about the Persistence Project and they don't know that they're in the persistent, you know, that their, their faculty member is engaged in these things. Um, but the, one of the big things that came out was around stu for students who remembered the one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and remembered having them, but that was particularly impactful for students. Um, and the quote here highlights that, right? That having, um, having those meetings was really um, kind of changed the relationship and changed often how they thought about the class. Um, and so I just want to highlight this as, as another thing that um, we, my office has not been as directly involved in in the past, although we were having conversations about what additional qualitative research would look like. Um, but having this kind of qualitative evidence and, and quotes from students, even if it's from our surveys, has been really impactful. I love the data and the charts and the information, but that's not always what everybody responds to, right? And so often having the stories and the qualitative evidence has been helpful for telling the story about the Persistence Project at Oakton and its impact and also in um, getting more faculty participation. Okay. Finally, as we look to the future, um, things that we are looking at and talking about, um, the committee, uh, our faculty persistence project committee is interested in assessing the effectiveness of some of their faculty training modules, which are currently optional. And they've developed these in response to faculty feedback and, and interest in different, you know, information and support. And so we are interested to kind of help them see how effective those have been. We're looking at revising and conducting our student survey again with a comparison group this fall. Um, so some of that is re revising the instrument and, and considering what information we want and need. And then also, of course, improving response rates. That's always, uh, always a task. Uh, we're looking for ways to control for instructor selection bias, right? So instructors self-select into this. Um, it's um, just the, the way it has always worked at Oakton. And so trying to think through, we've, we've looked at um, over time, right? trying to look at pre before they uh, join the program and after they join the program. So, you know, we're, we're really trying to think of, think through ways to, to control for that selection bias. Um, we do want to utilize more of our student record data. So um, kind of starting to look at, at dosage, if you think of caring campuses as an, a thing that they can get, right? Some of our students have been enrolled in two or three persistence project course sections in one semester. Um, so understanding does that does that then impact um, you know does it have a additive impact then on whether or not students um, persist or the kind of their perceptions um, as well as over time right so we've really focused on new students in their first term um, but we imagine that it also has impact for continuing students or if you have it in your first term and you have it in your second term and in your third term right what's the additive impact there 
looking at course retention and early drops. Actually, Brad mentioned this earlier, um, and something that we he and I have talked about. Uh, really trying to think about you know who's enrolled and and what what do early drops even look like, um, and and could we even I know you were talking, Brad, about before census, but we've even been talking about in that first week or two of classes, right? Who who's, who leaves in that drop ad period? And then completion and transfer, as I mentioned before, right? We were looking to update our, our analysis of that. And then certainly some qualitative data collection opportunities. And then while I have focused entirely on our faculty uh, persistence project or care and campus initiative, we are also uh, launching our staff care and campus initiative. And we've been working with that team to think about um, implementation and commitments and, and knowledge, you know, uh, surveying around um, knowledge and understanding of those commitments as well. And so we're excited to launch that and get off that off the ground. And that is it. And I appreciate all of your time and attention and letting me share a little bit about the work we've done at Oakton. Uh, Dr. Becker, thank you so much for your time. We do, I know, have a few questions. Sure. Uh, Diana Rose is, uh, has one as well. If we could take three to five minutes for questions, just so we don't lose those thoughts, mm -hmm. and then we can move on to the toolkit. You'll see how easy the toolkit is in just a moment. So um, Diana, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure, just to, uh, and you may have, well, first of all, thank you for sharing the data, Kelly. I um, I, I love, I'm a visual learner, so seeing charts and, and um, so forth really helps. But the yeah. stories just enhance that. So I agree, you know, that both. So and I'm sorry, I, missed, I may have missed it in the beginning. So the the persistent students, are they told in advance? Like, uh, OK, so so you do it strictly. So it's anonymous as far as they're concerned mm -hmm. or a blind kind of a thing. And yep. so they're identified strictly by those volunteer faculty in the student roster. OK, exactly. Yes. So we match core sections that the faculty that the faculty report. Um, with who's enrolled with those classes, right? So there's no um, student self-selection into or out of other than if they know that they want a particular faculty member or they're taking a certain class. And that makes sense. And we have at uh, Hartnell College here in Salinas, California, we just started. Yay. Yes, we're super excited with our classified staff. So I'm looking forward to seeing um, um, and going through the toolkit to see that connection. Faculty tends to be, you know, maybe easier to draw that direct connection. So I'm, I'm really eager to work on the classified toolkit. So thank you. Yes. Same. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> uh, other questions for Kelly? Please just uh, use your uh, response. Uh, we have a chat. Let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, let's get started then on the toolkit. So still sharing my screen. And so I'm gonna walk you through the toolkit. Um, it's really easy to use. I'm really thrilled about how it was designed. Um, we start off with logic models. Um, and the reason we start off with a logic model is as researchers, you have to explain all this stuff to folks, right? Well, what does it mean to do this? So we're trying to give you every assistance we can in the way the toolkit is set up. So we find the logic models are really helpful for really understanding the conceptual framework behind the, you know, how this is all supposed to work. We also share with you, which we won't go over today, the pre-assessment surveys. So before a college actually joins Caring Campus, there is a pre-assessment survey that we do because there are times where we have a grant and let's say it works for 10 colleges, but we have 20 colleges that want to join. Well, we have to make an assessment on to that college's readiness. And, you know, as you know, what is it? The average tenure of a college president is maybe three years or so. I don't know what the latest data is, but, you know, if they have a brand new president or interim, it might not be a good idea to start something this culture changing with that interim president or even that brand new president as they're kind of getting their feet wet. There will be surveys on that toolkit that show early and mid implementation for both staff and faculty. And those survey instruments are not just for the staff and faculty, but also for students. So we'll walk you through those and all the questions are already listed. And as I said before, you can use the questions, you can modify them, we don't care. It's really just a starting point to help you as researchers investigate the efficacy of this work. Uh, most of the toolkit is really focused around qualitative data collection and analysis. As Kelly shared with you, the quantitative stuff, most of us as researchers, we're kind of used to that. But what's in there on the quantitative portion is the definitions so that we have some consistency around what it means in terms of student retention. 
student success, uh, terms, all of that good stuff. So with that, I'm going to exit out and I'm going to call up the toolkit. And so this is, can you all see this okay? You all see the toolkit? Great. So this is the cover of the toolkit, but, and I'm just going to scroll through. So it may be a little awkward, but I'm going to do my best here. And so what we have to start with is a table of contents. What we've done with the table of contents is even though it's a PDF, you can click on whatever section you want. So for example, if you want to look at early implementation of student feedback, you just click and there it is. So it's really easy to focus on what it is you care about, what it is you want to look at. So what I'd like to do, however, is I'd like to go back to the logic models. So let's walk through this a little bit. So we're all familiar with logic models. They deal with inputs. They get to outputs. They talk about the kinds of things that we do. And by the way, is this big enough to see? Or should I make it bigger? If you can make it bigger, that would be good. I will make it bigger. Green. And just forgive me as I scroll, because it may be a little awkward. Is that OK? Great. Thank you, Rebecca. So what we see here is on these inputs, we'll see for the coaching part. So that's IABC's piece. You know, we have cross-functional coaching, and we didn't go over the whole process. You can read about that on our website, um, and we have a, slot, a, a link to that, which we'll share with you. Um, the support of senior leadership is really critical, and that we're really planning for going to scale. Now, a lot of the work that we do in the, in the community colleges, we talk about pilots. The difference between Caring Campus and other things is it's not a pilot. The idea is to go to scale. Now, it doesn't mean it has to go to scale yesterday. What it means is it's the plan is to go to scale. You may ramp up over time, but we don't believe in pilots. I always call this the death of pilots. Having been in this business for a really long time, it's now 33 years. Um, I just don't believe in pilots. So then we think about the logic model of the resources that the college brings, which is the staff knowledge. So in this case, on the logic model, Many of your colleges have staff that have master's degrees, doctor degrees. They live in the community. You know, in our experience, 40% of the staff that participate in our sessions have gone to the very college for which they're now working at. These are folks that are incredibly committed. So there's also other initiatives. And one of the things that we always say is we don't like to say Caring Campus is an initiative. We like to say Caring Campus adds the human component. So as you're describing this work, once you do this research, it's not another initiative. It's how do we make that human connection with all the stuff that we're doing? Then we move on to staff attitudes and experiences. I won't go through all of that. But the key thing, as I said earlier, is the idea behind staff behaviors, right? What is it that staff actually do? Look, I don't care if they don't like something or like something. I care about how they interact with that student. And so that's why we focus on behaviors. Then we look at those intermediate student outcomes. Um, and you know, you've probably read a ton of stuff about sense of belonging. That's really where Caring Campus lives. Um, but one of the things that's fascinating that we've discovered through this work is this really does change culture. So Kelly, I don't know, uh, you know, you were fairly new since you've been there four years, but the culture does change around how faculty and staff relate to one another through this caring campus work. It's like being nice to one another really makes a difference. It's kind of fascinating. And then, of course, the ultimate outcomes are we want students to persist. We want them to be successful. So I know, Diana, you talked about the staff work. So this logic model helps inform that staff work when we'll show you all the surveys and so forth in just a little bit. Now let's just move to the faculty work real quick. Same kind of thing on the logic model. So what we do here with the faculty is a little bit different. Uh, the process is different. We actually ask you as the researchers to provide us with three semesters worth of data on every single faculty member anonymously on their success and retention rates. And the reason we do that is you, and we never say that you're not already a caring campus because every campus is caring. But what we find is that there are faculty among STEM, uh, CTE, liberal arts, that are already practicing these behaviors. We just don't know that they are until we look at the data. Once we look at the data, we find a number of faculty with very high retention rates and very high success rates. That's why that term bright spots comes out in that very first description. 
And those folks are invited to participate in the working group. And so um, you also have, you know, the vision for the college and where it's going, all the other success initiatives and the inputs. And then, of course, you have the faculty experience and all the work that they've done with their teaching uh, career. Um, and, you know, many states have performance funding. So there's a real look now at not just how many students we get in the door, but how many students are successful. Um, Texas just did a whole new bill on performance funding. In fact, most of their funding is now going to come from outcomes. Um, and then, of course, here's the commitments on faculty behaviors, learning students' names, transparent syllabus, one-on-one -on -one meetings with students that Kelly described, um, assignments and assessments early and often, monitoring student progress. And, and by the way, I'm the anti-early alert system person. So any of you that have early alert systems that are electronic, I get in a lot of trouble when I do keynotes and I talk about how I don't like these things, but I don't believe in them, they don't work. Um, and then the whole issue of compassion expectations, which we call situational fairness. And then we think about as students are engaged in this work, how students are now building more relationships with each of these faculty members, how that connection really does matter. We have some videos on our YouTube site, and it talks about one of the professors uh, from Victor Valley College talks about how he teaches math, of course, in all of your colleges. Guess what? Lowest retention, lowest success rates. I will almost guarantee that at every single college that I'm that's on now. Um, but he says, look, when I show care, the student works harder because they want to please me as an adult in authority. So there's a reciprocal relationship that occurs based on these commitments being uh, in, in, engaged in. So students feel that sense of belonging. And then of course we get to the cultural piece. And then finally, what do we care about? We want increases in <coughs> student performance, their persistence, and eventually getting to degrees, certificates, and transfer. Okay, any questions about the logic models? And look, they're not perfect. You can adjust these however you want, but we, we have them to help you to share with your colleagues when you're presenting this data. Any questions at this point? All right, let me move on. So I'm just gonna scroll down and uh, we're not gonna go through the Caring Campus Readiness Assessment, but you'll see how we assess colleges. We use a Likert scale. We have multiple people at the institution or IBC rate them and so forth. So um, I'm sorry, let me get to this part here. So the first thing that you might want to think about, especially, you know, um, Diana, you mentioned that, you know, Hartnell, you're new at this, right? So Hartnell's starting out. Um, one of the things you want to do or consider doing is when people first come to this world of caring campus, ask them about the kinds of things they're already doing, how they feel about the behavioral commitments, um, what barriers are there? Because guess what we always hear? We have too many interventions. We're overloaded. We can't possibly do another thing, right? So this survey, set of survey items helps get to that issue. And things like, how do things happen in your own department? One of the things that we find that's critical with staff, so as researchers, it's, it, you already know this, but I'm just going to reiterate it. Those middle managers, those supervisors are so critical as to enabling and allowing the staff members to engage in these commitments. So, for example, one of the commitments is warm referral. And that means that a staff member would either call ahead to another department when that student has a question they can't answer or walk the student, as I described in the example of that Arkansas chancellor, to another department. Well, gosh, if you have a line, you can't possibly walk the student over, but you can call ahead. But there may be supervisors that are allowing these things to happen or not. So we want to get at that supervisor. Are they allowing that to happen? Then we have um, early implementation feedback for those that didn't go through the coaching sessions. So what we're looking at here is implementation rollout. That is, at your college, it are these commitments being shared with colleagues across the college. So this is a survey to help understand that because one of the things that we ask colleges to do after our initial sessions are completed is hold a work group. So a work group in this case is made up of staff members with an administrator supporting those staff members. And their job is to really figure out 
the best way to implement based on the work groups that develop the plans? Like, how do we really get this out there? So the question is, is this really happening? So if you're interested in implementation research, these are some questions that'll help you get to that. And then um, we also have for students. So if you're interested in doing some baseline work, understanding how your students are experiencing your college, these questions help these students or help you understand what students are experiencing. So for example, student belonging, question number one, did you feel welcome when you first arrived? What kinds of things made you feel welcome or unwelcome? One of the um, uh, pieces that the CCRC did was they interviewed leaders, so CEOs around the country, around Caring Campus. And I love one of the comments that the CEO said. He said, look, we can have the best guided pathways work in the world. We have advisors, we're all set up, but if that guided pathways advisor is not welcoming and warm, that student's gonna go, okay, this isn't for me, I'm out. So it's that kind of thing that we're trying to get at here. All right, uh, then we have mid implementation feedback. So after this thing has already started, you know, what's happening, is that working? And I'll just move on because I wanna get to the faculty piece because we're running out of time. Um, and then um, we also have questions for senior leadership. So to find out what they're doing, one of the things we ask our senior leaders to do is we want them in every meeting to start with a caring campus moment. Look, senior meetings, they get to uh, work with their vice presidents and their colleagues, and they have hard stuff to deal with. They could have budget cuts, right? They could have closings of programs, all sorts of terrible things. But why are we here, right? We always wanna start with, we want students to feel connected. What's our favorite caring campus moment? All right, and then we have mid-implementation feedback for students. I'm just scrolling. I know I'm going really fast. Um, and then what's critical that I want to spend a minute on is in departments, such as admissions and records, veterans affairs, wherever students actually go, it's really important, and especially now that we have QR codes that are so easy to do, is, uh, and we have one college, San Antonio College, the last Aspen Award winner. They have a big sign that says, here's the commitments that you're supposed to expect. And they have a QR code right on the sign. And students can use that QR code to provide feedback. And here are some of the, uh, the, the ideas about how to do this and then getting to the questions. Right, and just a few questions when it comes to a point of service survey, a POS survey. Okay, now we're moving on to faculty, same kind of thing. We have the pre-assessment, and then uh, we move on to early implementation. So we're trying to learn about faculty and look, faculty have busy jobs. Is it feasible to even do this work? Is it feasible to even integrate this? You know, faculty will always tell you, I got a million things to do, I'm too busy. So you can get some of this baseline data. It will also help you inform your implementation. And then we move on to um, non-participants. So, you know, what's going on at the campus? What kinds of development, faculty development is going on? You know, sometimes we're surprised that there's not much faculty development going on. Um, we often see no staff development going on. And, you know, of course, we're trying to change that because staff are so critical. By the way, I did this research uh, just looking at the percent of employees in California community colleges that are staff versus other, 58.8% of the full-time employees in the California community colleges are staff. They're not administrators, they're not faculty. So it's really critical that they are out there and, and, and um, really part of hopefully helping student success. But along with the faculty, we ask things like, what kind of strategies do you already use to create a more welcoming environment? So you get a good baseline of all of this. Then there's mid-implementation, um, and it talks about a whole bunch of things like the, the paradigm in which they uh, engage with students, whether it's um, you know, a mixed method of virtual and face-to-face -face and so forth, trying to understand how that all works. Um, we also want to understand how often they're there. So one of the things that we do with the faculty work is we ask colleges to change the name from faculty office hours to student hours. I, it's a simple little word change, but I can't tell you the huge difference that makes. One of the colleges thought of this, we did not. And now we advise every college to change that because students are terrified to go to the faculty offices. They think the faculty are there to grade papers and develop their lectures. 
Okay, so moving down, um, so I wanna get just to the definitional side. There's mid implementation of senior feedback when it comes to uh, the faculty work as well. I'm just gonna scroll a little bit faster here. Um, and then of course we have student feedback as well. So the questions are already pre-populated to understand students. And if you're already doing like a campus climate survey, you may wanna consider adding these questions in your existing campus climate surveys to learn about Caring Campus and how it's going. And then here's just the coding section, which I wanted to get to before we open up for just a few questions. So we've tried to make it consistent so that when you do this research, it's consistent across colleges. So we've had some definitions, some descriptions, of the various kinds of things that we talk about with whether it's coaching activities, how we select uh, faculty and staff and so forth. When it comes to the quantitative data, the definitions are all here too. So what fall enrollment graduation, what we call upward transfer, fall to spring persistence, course see or better, whatever. So it's all defined because I know that, you know, there are a million definitions for a first time in college student. Right. So we try to make it consistent for all of you. So hopefully you'll be willing to follow all this. Right. So that we can have some consistent research across colleges. And so you'll see many more definitions and things. So that is the toolkit. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Because what I want to do is simply share with you um, the toolkit. You can click on this link and I'm going to put it in the chat. So let me grab it. I have to actually hit escape here. Sorry. I'll put it in the chat. So here's the toolkit that you can download. Um, and what you'll see is uh, the web page that has the toolkit. So there's other things on that. And then I'm also going to uh, download for you the CCRC, or rather upload into the chat, the CCRC um, website that has all the different reports that they have. And then my contact information is also listed here if you have questions outside of this. I'll stay on for a few minutes afterwards if anyone wants to stay. Perhaps I can answer some questions for you. Um, but at this point, we have just a minute or two. Um, I'd love to hear if you have any feedback, what do you think, questions, anything like that that we can help support you in as you investigate Caring Campus. It's always the first one that takes time to talk. And then after that, it's good. <laughs> so no one breath. request, um, sorry, uh, and then I've got to log off, but um, it would be nice to, so this was a great connection. And um, Kelly, as you go down your path of uh, uh, developing the classified survey, I, it would be great to connect, right? With, cause I'm not the researcher, I'm an HR. And, uh, but I sent this link to our H our uh, researchers saying, I think you should be on this call. But anyway, it'd be, it'd be nice to network, you know, with others. So um, we're, we're not going through this alone. <laughs> or so let me just share with you, Diana, that we do round tables. Oh, cool. Creating a caring campus network. And those round tables will happen two, three times a semester. Okay. And so that's an opportunity to network because now that we're at 121 and soon to be at 150 colleges, it makes sense to do that. Also a national conference. There's all these things that are planned. So great question. Um, Debbie, you have a question. Debbie Weatherly. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I love the fact that you mentioned how faculty and staff relate to one another and being nice. We actually just uh, have started our Caring Campus with the staff. So that was our first initial, and, and I know faculty are interested in doing it as well. But um, I just love that uh, concept of changing the culture of the whole college and how they respond to one another, especially during this time when people have really become disengaged because of the COVID and working from home and different things that are going on um, that have changed. I think it's, it's wonderful, the idea of bringing everyone back together and that caring for one another and staff, as well as our students, it's just going to make such a difference on the on the campus, I can tell. So yeah, if you take a look at those CCRC reports, you'll see all the talk about culture change and the difference that it makes. So Debbie, that's a great observation. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts? And we also have some IBC Caring Campus coaches on, so they can certainly respond and not just me. Let me check the chat real quick. Uh, folks are saying I have to run. Let me see if there's any, oh, let me send this out. 
um, the Columbia University one. And no, I don't see any other questions, but happy to stay on for a few minutes. If you like, can we uh, all join together and thank uh, Dr. Kelly Becker for her presentation and the great work they're doing at Oakton. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for the opportunity, Brad. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's been a great honor to work with you. Thank you. Likewise. Great. Um, so I'll stay on for a few minutes um, and hang out. And if you have questions, I'm happy to attempt to answer them. Any other questions? Uh, I want in the chat, let's see here. Nope, just a thank you. Okay, um, well, Kelly, thanks again. Uh, let me, uh, I don't know if we're still recording.